and welcome to Inside Healthcare. This is our 14th year for bringing you the Emmy-nominated and Emmy Award-winning show, Inside Healthcare. Every month since January 2005, we have been bringing you the very latest in healthcare news and broadcasting from here at the SEC TV studios in White Bear Lake. I'm very privileged to work with an awesome and talented TV director and crew who work behind the scenes. Together, we have produced more than 150 shows and have interviewed more than 450 guests including top local doctors, healthcare professionals, and wonderful patients who have shared their personal stories with us. Thank you for watching us on YouTube and on one of a dozen Twin Cities cable TV stations which broadcast our show. And we welcome our newest viewers watching us on CCX Media Northwest Community TV in Brooklyn Park, Minnesota on Channel 12. So thank you for watching. Now we begin this program with the very latest on this year's flu, and we take you on location to talk with a local doctor about it. It is the cold and flu season, and for some answers to your questions about this year's flu season, we're joined by Dr. Rob Anderson with Urgency Room. Glad to have you back with us. Thank you. And Thanks we're actually inside the Urgency Room where you're Thank seeing you a lot of action. Yeah. So I know initially the CDC in December were saying how low acti flu activity, mm -hmm. maybe some of the southeastern states were seeing yeah. some activity. What are you seeing here in the Urgency Room? Well, you know, it was kind of more sporadic at the beginning of December, and I think it's right before Christmas that they moved it up to a local level. So we're seeing more influenza, uh, more confirmed cases coming in. And what are the symptoms that you're seeing? You know, a lot of symptoms of influenza are just sudden onset, horrible body aches, high fever, dry cough. You just feel like you've been hit by a truck. You just want to sleep all day and just you feel run down. <laughs> You know, I've been hearing a lot of people saying they felt like they had the flu, but mm -hmm. I was thinking, well, with not a lot of activity, maybe mm -hmm. that wasn't truly the flu. It could have been something else. Yeah, you know, it was sporadic initially, but now it is local, so it is picking up a little bit. We've been seeing a lot of just your normal run-of-the-mill viruses as well. You know, just a cough, cold, everyone's around everybody for the holidays and New Year's and all that. And they're hanging out with people that are sick and people try to wash their hands, cover their cough, but it's still spread out there. And especially right after the holidays, mm -hmm. people get together, mm -hmm. close quarters and things yeah, like that. Exactly. A lot of germ spreading as yeah, well as yeah. good cheer. Yeah. So um, talking about the, the flu vaccine in mm -hmm. particular, people you know should have gotten that back in the fall, but if they yep. haven't, what's the advantage of getting a flu well, shot now? The, Absolutely. I still recommend getting the flu shot if you have not yet, because we're still kind of at that local level. You know, we haven't gone up to the next level, and there's still opportunity to get the influenza shot, the vaccine, and then to have some immunity. And we've seen in years past that it hasn't been as effective, but some of the initial data that came out in December showed that the flu strains that we're seeing, it's mainly influenza A, okay. but this year's vaccine is looking like it might have good coverage for it. Oh, that sounds really mm -hmm. good news. Yeah. So never too late, you can still never get it, but yep. it does take a couple of weeks for mm -hmm. it to get full immunity and yep. stuff. Yeah. Yep. And you know, even kids as young as six months can get it. So if you had a baby, you know, last July, you know, maybe your child couldn't get the influenza vaccine until January. So mm -hmm. go ahead and bring your baby into the pediatrician to have that conversation. And you do recommend it for just about any age, mm -hmm. but there are some age groups that are even more vulnerable and should be making yeah. sure that they have it. Yeah, the younger kids, the infants, the elderly. If you're immunocompromised, if you're on chemotherapy for cancer, if you are on an immunosuppressant, you're gonna be more predisposed to getting influenza and having worse side effects and uh, symptoms of influenza. And the spray um, vaccine yeah, so is back. available this yep. year? It was gone for about two years. Um, they said maybe it's not as effective, but it is back and it is an option. The American Academy of Pediatrics came out with a statement in December as well, though. They said that probably not the flu mist. I mean, if you're terrified of needles and you're not getting the flu shot because you don't like needles, well, you can get the mist. That's okay, but the shot will be a little bit better. And any side effects getting the mist versus getting the vaccine shot? You know, shot they say itself? you may develop a small immune reaction to it, just a small little kind of more of a cold symptoms. And what about that myth? Some say, well, I got my flu shot, so then I got sick. But it, it is possible. <laughs> it is possible. So it's possible you could get the flu shot and you pick up some other viral illness, not influenza, but you maybe interpret that as being influenza. So it's always a possibility. And yes, to answer your question, though, some people do get influenza after they got the influenza vaccine. They might have been already getting it. They may have already they... been getting it. Maybe they didn't have the immunity, but 
maybe the strain wasn't you know perfect for that season, but ultimately we do know that if you get the influenza vaccine and you still get influenza, your symptoms will be less severe. They mm -hmm. won't last as long. So if you don't think that you feel well, imagine if you had not gotten that influenza vaccine, you feel even worse. And what is that duration again for the flu? How long does it usually last? You know, maybe around a week or so, seven to 10 days. And if it goes beyond that? You know, if it's getting beyond that, even as you're getting up to day number seven, if you're feeling even worse, if you can't breathe, if you're having any difficulty in breathing, if your fever is staying up there and you're taking Tylenol, ibuprofen, it's still high and you feel very uncomfortable, mm -hmm. we worry about those side effects, or the, not the side effects, but the complications of influenza, such as pneumonia. In kids, they can get ear infections. So if you have any concern that it feels like more than just a run-of-the-mill influenza, which isn't fun, but if it's feeling worse, then you should certainly be seen. We have the ability to check the oxygen number here, the pulse oximetry, to make sure that you're getting enough oxygen into your body. We can do x-rays here at the urgency room as well to look for that complication Good. of pneumonia. And then um, what can they be doing at home to treat themselves, mm -hmm. you know, if they have some of these symptoms? Yeah, and... it's a good question. Plenty of rest. Drinking plenty of fluid. It's amazing that rest, how it, it can does. heal the body. Yep. Yeah. yep, you need it. And taking Tylenol, ibuprofen is very helpful as well. And when should someone, and why should someone bring their loved ones or mm -hmm. themselves to mm -hmm. the urgency room when they suspect that they have the flu? That's a good question. It's often tough to determine at home. First off, because influenza is miserable. Nobody likes getting it. You're so uncomfortable. Like I said at the beginning, you just feel like you've been hit by a bus. Just so, you know, mm -hmm. just knocks you down. But if you feel like things are getting worse, if you're coughing up you know, tons of sputum, if you don't feel like you can catch your air, if you're wheezing, um, if you have bad ear pain, a sore throat, um, then I come back in. Yeah, it seems like every year we do hear a number of people that end up in the hospital mm -hmm. because they have complications. That's right. So, uh, Dr. Rob Anderson, mm -hmm. always great information. Yeah. Really appreciate your time. Well, Thanks. thank you for coming to the urgency room here in Egan. And we'll be right back with more. Did you go tanning? You're getting so tan. We need some sun. Protect yourself. Protect your friends. Stop tanning. Learn more at spotskincancer.org. I'm uh, 42 years old. I'm a retired firefighter paramedic. And I live with severe PTSD. Mm -hmm. Along the lines, uh, you just keep some of the calls. They scar up on you, and, and some of them you, you notice while the scars are being created, and some of the other ones you don't, and you just try to write it off that it's part of the job. The nightmares started coming more often. Um, I would work 24-hour shifts, and on a busy shift, sleep four, and still not be able to go home and sleep. My body wouldn't relax. I started drinking more, started thinking of suicide uh, because I couldn't get this under control. I couldn't fix myself. I couldn't man up and uh, deal with it. So I, uh, I thought I was broken and I thought that I was ashamed that I couldn't handle this and I couldn't fix it and I couldn't be like how I thought everybody else was. I didn't know the truth that a lot of a lot of firefighters and first responders suffer from this and deal with the same thing. I just lost all hope and figured out after eight years that this is never going to get better and uh, uh, I put a gun to my head. I was home alone and I went to the closet and I pulled out a handgun and I closed the door and I sat on the floor and, uh, and I put it to my head, pulled the hammer back and then I remembered uh, that uh, it was my son's first day of kindergarten. And then I'd walked him to school that morning and uh, we lived just down the street from the school and he was uh, gonna be walking home. And I realized my son would be the one to find me. And I put the gun down. Thank you to Brian Cristofano for sharing his story with us. He's not alone with his emotional distress. Research shows that firefighters and paramedics experience much higher rates of emotional distress than in the general population, including suffering from depression and post-traumatic stress disorder. A new Minnesota initiative is aimed at helping our firefighters. Take a look. 
Firefighters are tasked with helping people that might be dealing with an emergency on the worst day of their lives. And it's something that firefighters are trained to be able to do. But over a career, dealing with people's emergencies day in and day out can take a toll on a firefighter. We need these guys to protect us, to help us. I, I don't know what we would do without them. It's an epidemic that people don't want to address. No one, <laughs> no one wants to admit they've got mental health issues. And I've not wanted to admit it because in our culture it's weak. We have no shortage of people that say, I did, that doesn't affect me, it doesn't bother me. And I was one of those guys for a long time. You know, they're out here, they're under a lot of stress. They don't even know the condition of their own homes or their own families. So it's a difficult situation for all of us. Putting not only their lives on the line, but also their emotions. They see some pretty, some pretty bad stuff in their careers. Um, a lot of, uh, a lot of it has to do with, with children, young adults, uh, and uh, it's often children uh, of the age of their own children, which can be particularly damaging to uh, first responders. And firefighters are no exception. Firefighters, every time they go out, they are walking into somebody else's worst day where we'd be asked to provide life-saving interventions or ultimately pronounce the victim deceased. So from um, jumpers to uh, gunshot, suicide. That and they are exposed sometimes to pretty grisly and horrific things as well occasionally. And that can sear itself into your memory and leave images and thoughts behind. Kids and, you know, it was the the same spot we had done a rescue on the year before, the exact same spot in the bluffs. The knowing you're going to go into work and put on all your USAR gear and start digging for a dead body just is a really terrible evening. You see this stuff and you deal with this stuff on a daily basis. The disability gets louder and louder and, you, and you, you can't ignore it and it starts getting louder by causing problems in your personal life. You notice you're not sleeping. You notice you might be drinking a lot more. Find yourself in, in the depression. The incidence of suicidal ideation is about 10 times higher in the EMS provider population than it is in the normal population. I'm concerned about that and uh, trying to do something about it. You know, losing three friends to suicide, knowing their families, knowing what it did to them, knowing what it did to, to me, my crew, and knowing that this is still going on. You can read it every day. I'm worried about the ones that can handle some of the trauma, but ultimately, over years of exposure to that, it weighs on them. They don't have good coping mechanisms. They're not sure what to do, and they feel lost, but they don't want to communicate because they're concerned that's a sign of weakness. So I want to provide avenues for people to go out and seek that help. The reality is that you don't always know what members are dealing with or struggling with. And so I think that alone makes me feel we have to be more proactive in getting out the information and making it acceptable to communicate and talk about our problems before they escalate to that extent. The legislature has taken some really positive steps in the, the presumptive uh, PTSD law. It's pretty much now accepted that the things we do 
and C are, are just accepted as contributors. Our job is accepted as a contributor to that. In fact, it was gone two minutes ago. <laughs> now it's back. And it's going away. It just, it comes and goes and comes and goes. Don't give up on them. They can, they're going through hell, literally. And uh, you have to, you have to help them find a way through the darkness. We need to take care of them too. They need to be taken care of. Join us now to talk about these health issues with firefighters. We're pleased to have with us, very pleased to have with us, Steve Shapiro. He is a retired St. Paul captain, fire, fire captain. So thank you for being with us. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. So we touched a little bit in the video talking about some of the issues. Um, and well, first of all, why don't we just tell us a little bit about your background besides being a retired fire captain? Sure, I spent 17 years on the St. Paul Fire Department. Uh, I, I, I contracted an occupational cancer and I was forced to retire in July of 2015. Um, cancer statistically by line of duty deaths is our number one killer now in the fire service for full-time firefighters. Um, so I've been an advocate for the state of Minnesota to educate firefighters and train firefighters across the state on cancer, uh, across the state on cancer awareness. And I also uh, teach through the Minnesota Firefighter Initiative who has three main target areas of cardiac, cancer, and emotional health and wellness for firefighters. So we'll talk a little bit more about that new initiative. So cancer, heart disease, and emotional distress are really high among firefighters and paramedics. Um, hazardous of the job, but Correct. And we need to be taking care of our firefighters. So. Absolutely, and unfortunately we have a culture in the fire service where we uh, kind of think of ourselves last, and that's part of what this initiative is trying to do, is to bring awareness to fire departments, big and small across the entire state, that firefighters have a, a, an outlet to now take care of themselves through this awareness training and all of the, uh, on all the available resources through the Minnesota Firefighter Initiative to help keep us safe and healthy. And this is something that you said you've been in the, you were 17 years, something that wasn't really talked about in the departments and things like that? Yeah, especially the uh, emotional trauma or the PTSD. Firefighters' mental health and wellness has never been really talked about. I think it's always been kind of taboo for firefighters to talk about whether they may be having some issues or not. And this awareness level training is bringing this um, kind of out of the shadows and into the forefront for everyone where it's okay to talk about this. It's okay to not be well and to need help. And that's really the stigma that we need to break down and stop this having this be so taboo for everyone in the fire service. And this was something, this initiative that was just passed by the state lawmakers just in the past year? Yeah, it was a grant, that, it was a grant uh, for fiscal year 2019 for the Minnesota okay. Firefighter Initiative. And what's involved with that? Um, they have a grant of $500,000 to reach hopefully 600 departments by June 30th of 2019. And this is something that you're actively doing. You just came from one actually, you were saying right before taping this. Correct. So we are actively out there uh, teaching to fire departments. We're recruiting to get new fire departments in to make sure everyone gets the training. Big and small, this affects departments across the entire state. So um, we, we have trainers. Uh, in all reaches, so we can get to anyone from northern Minnesota to southern Minnesota, the metro area. We have multiple people that are willing to go out and uh, help support their brothers and sisters in this effort. So what's involved with the training? Um, people go through a train the trainer course, uh, a full day train the trainer course, where they actually get to teach part of the course. They learn all the material that they don't know, and they're giving all the materials to study at home. And then they are proctored a little bit before they're actually out, sent out on their own. Most people have a time where they kind of teach to their own department as their first initial step teaching, okay. especially if you're not a, a, a regular instructor, because a lot of firefighters instruct. But if you're not a regular instructor, that's kind of a time where you learn to teach to your own people before we kind of send you out to other people in your area. And I imagine since it wasn't something that was talked about, that it's got to be eye-opening for when you're talking with these men and women of the fire departments. And yeah, it's, it's eye-opening for a lot of departments because health and wellness is so low on our budgetary priorities, unfortunately, in, in Minnesota. We're 45th in the nation in spending on fire service, and, and, that, and that just seems like a tragedy that we're, we're that low. Um, it, it takes an enormous amount of money just to get us up from 45 to 44th. It takes $100 million to get us from 45th to 40th. 
So that's a large wow. amount, that's a large investment just to get, move us five spots on a national ranking. And we think in Minnesota being more progressive and, and ahead of the Right. You know, the this, this one, I don't know if we're out front of the curve on. We're 21st in population and 45th in fire spending. You know, and in the, the video, too, we talked about that um, more firefighters die from suicide than in the line of duty. That's surprising and shocking, I think, to most people to hear that stati statistic. It, it's, ab it's absolutely tragic. And it's the, it's the unspoken thing of the fire service. Um, it's not classified technically as a line of duty death. If it were, you're exactly correct. It's the number one killer of firefighters right now. And that's really a, a very, very strong push of the Minnesota Firefighter Initiative is to, to stop that number if we can, and it's certainly if we can't stop it, to lower it through education, absolutely. And in the video we heard from a, fire, a former firefighter, Pete and, and Brian, and how the scars, emotional scars that they've accumulated that have been um, affecting them, affecting their health. And Yeah, and this is all interlinked. The, the, the stress of the job, uh, can cause PTSD, the stress of PTSD can cause cancer, can cause cardiac issues, so all of these things are interlinked like that. So treating one is just the start of probably treating, you know, maybe multiple symptoms in firefighters. And I know more firefighters who ha have this, and I don't know if we're still in a little bit of denial that this is still in the industry, but it's good to see people come forward, and of course I know both those gentlemen with my history at St. Paul, to have people be advocates for this because we can't just leave this in the dark anymore. We need people to step out and say, I've had this, and then to see them get treatment and actually be well. And that's the thing about PTSD is if you get treatment, this is only a temporary injury. Through talk therapy and other type of injury, or other type of uh, treatments available, you can cure this because it's actually not a disease or a disorder. It's just an illness that can be treated. Wow, that's a great way of looking at it. What does it mean for you to be out there educating and helping other departments now, having gone through your cancer experience as well? And You know, um, it's a deeply personal thing for me. I do it for a number of different reasons. Um, we're late to the game as far as the cancer piece goes. They've been tracking cancers around the country for years, and it's kind of like food or fashion trends. I always say things get to the Midwest kind of last. And um, the, the parent organization that I'm state director for, the Firefighter Cancer Support Network, has been around th since 2005. Oh. It's really only been active here in Minnesota since like 2013, 2014. Um, it, it's personal to me in the sense that I've lost colleagues to cancer. Um, and having survived cancer, um, th there's really no other way to say that other than I feel I owe it back to my fire service to give back as a survivor. If survivors don't get back and tell their stories, how do we prevent the next people, the next generation from getting sick? So it's really a personal thing for me. So there's a hotline number that they can call and stuff if there's someone they want to talk to or get more information about the initiative? Yeah, the Min Fire Initiative has their hotline number and that is, uh, it's not answered 24 hours a day, but people can leave a message and then they are connected with someone. Uh, we have people in the field, in the public safety field, will, that will get you to the right person. I am the cancer person, so I will receive the phone calls if someone calls about getting a new cancer diagnosis, which um, sadly, in the last three weeks, just prior to Christmas, we had nine new diagnoses oh that I gosh. was made aware of, just that I was made aware of, in the state of Minnesota. So I received those calls. And the average amount of time to get a call back from that number when you leave a message is about an hour. I think the longest since the line has been open for um, about a year and a half, two years, has been five hours. So if firefighters are in need, you'll get help almost immediately. It's got to be calming to hear from someone like you who's been through it, especially if they're newly diagnosed and stuff, like to, that you can survive this. And yeah, and if nothing else, I'm just an ear of experience with someone in the public safety field where you can bounce your feelings, your ideas, your thoughts. I mean, it's an all-encompassing diagnosis. When I got my diagnosis, I knew immediately everything in my life was going to change. I knew my relationship with my wife, my kids. I knew my job was probably going to be at risk. You know, my health, facing your own mortality. All those things go through your mind in a matter of seconds. So. Um, if, I'm that, if I can be that ear to lend what little experience and advice I can give, I'm more than willing to do that. That's got to be very comforting to the men and women that you're talking to about that then. I, I mean, I hope so. That's, what, that's yeah. what we're trying to do. You know, that's what we're trying to, you know, I can't change the diagnosis. I can't, I, I can't, you know, do anything medically speaking for them. But you can certainly, you know, bounce your frustrations off me if that helps. What can um, the general viewers that are watching, what can they do to help firefighters and paramedics? You know, uh, there's, I think the biggest thing, um, 
the Minnesota Fire Initiative is really the leading source for helping everyone in all three of these areas, cardiac, emotional health and wellness, and cancer. Uh, of course, they're interested in, in, in donations, but they're also interested in in-kind services. Anyone who'd be willing to give a service that you have that will help, the, help them, um, help the organization. It is a 501c3 charitable organization, so people can donate directly to them like that. It's tax deductible. Services can be written off. Of course, I'm not a lawyer or a legal expert or anything like that, but they take all of that in-kind. So th that's one way the public can give back. Well, as we heard in the closing comments in the video from Pete's wife, that we need to be taking care of you guys. We need to be taking care of the firefighters that care for us. Yeah, and, and like I said previously, um, firefighters go in and respond to emergencies. We, we always put ourselves last. That's always kind of been the motto of the fire service is, we'll deal with it ourselves, we'll take care of ourselves, we're here to help the public. That's why people get into public safety and public service. Mm -hmm. um, it, you know, maybe that culture needs to shift a little bit because we do need to take care of our own because we're losing our brothers and sisters to multiple different things here. Final comments for our viewers on helping the firefighters or about this initiative. What do you want to leave them with? You know, um, we're an underfunded service. We need support. And, you know, even if it's just bringing something down to your local fire station, firefighters appreciate when they're acknowledged, when they do a good job, because most of the time in, in the fire service, we get things right, you know, at a really high percentage of the time. Unfortunately, the things that we remember are the bad calls where things don't go right. And it may not even be our fault. You know, we may not be able to respond to that car accident in time. We may not get that house fire call until it's too late. And those are the ones that stick with us. So when we do things right and we help people, it's always wonderful to hear that we've done a great job. Well, thank you for your service that you have given <laughs> to the, the city and the community as well. So thank you, Steve. And thanks for your time. I know that you're very busy. So thank you for coming on and talking about this very um, sensitive and, and very important health issue. So thank you. No, I appreciate you taking it up. We need more people to know what's going on and I really appreciate your time. Thank you. Before we go, we leave you with an original song called Before You Go, performed by former firefighter Brian Cristofano. We'll see you next time on Inside Healthcare. Just another